trunk like paper, cause we from that same. Slab is just a hobby, it's an art. License and insurance ain't enough, you need heart. I remember when it hit me way back in 83. Swankers were on the road by the true OGs. Now it's 14 years later and the shit ain't stopped. I got the things in the truck on the way to the shop. See the big boy, candy washed up, looking good. Candy red jeans, special attention to the home at the wood. A hundred goes clear over candy sunset. In my lap, I'm rolling Roll burger, flipping jacks, pushing beers, swinging legs, straight to Nike, starting stuff. Piece of chain, pocket stacks, south side, looking good on that hustle every day. Cause we gon' stack paper so we can parlay. Roll that burger, flipping jacks, pushing beers, swinging legs. What's up, Drake. y'all? This is Lil WB of Slab OG TV back at again with another interview. Today, I got a south side OG up in here, you know what I'm saying? That's been around for a long time, the 80s, the 90s, you know what I'm saying? A lot of the history that y'all hear about, a lot of pictures y'all done seen, you know what I'm saying? Hey, he was a part of it, you know, and was there to tell you the history and give you straight facts. So without further ado, introduce yourself to the people. Free game, free game. What's up, baby? This OG Charlie Franks, a.k.a. OGOD, you know what I'm saying? SA Foods representing, you know what I'm talking about? I'm glad to be here with my boy WB. We gonna kick it. We gonna kick it around. We are gonna bring it all the way from the '80s to the 2000s on yeah. this slab game, free game. Yeah, I really, I really. And can you just kind of break down, you know, what side of town you from in Houston? I'm from. Uh, well, my family from Sunnyside. I was raised in South Acres. You know what I mean. So I was, I was raised in South Acres, Cloverland area. You know yeah. what I'm saying. Back there, Scarface, Little Flip, that little area. You know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Can you kind of like break down like what it was, you know, growing up in South Park, you know, uh, South Acres? I'm, I'm from the North Side, so I kind of look at it like it's all damn near the same, you know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, I read one time that on the, you know, on the internet that back in the 80s and in the 90s, the South Side of Houston was like, it, it damn near like cannibalized itself, you know, during the crack era, you know what I'm saying? Can you kind of speak on growing up and and being a part of that time? Yeah, you know, I ain't gonna lie, I got in the game at an early age, so uh, so I got a chance to see it from an inside view. Mm. And so I watched how crack ravished the community, you know what I'm saying, especially with my brother, he used to get high. And uh, so I watched the relationship between families deteriorate, between communities deteriorate, morals deteriorate, you know what I mean? And so, because the drugs and the addiction had people doing things in their addiction that they probably wouldn't normally do, you know, stealing from their family, Mm -hmm. stealing from their mamas, you know, doing anything for money. And Mm -hmm. so it kind of fucked up the the family structure, the family, the, uh, like you say, the, uh, the family, uh, structure the thread of the family and the community because back then you used to could just walk in people's houses like everybody was family you know you walk in hey mama you know what I mean you walk in now now you know nigga don't even want you to know where they live mm. you know what I'm saying nigga don't want you dropping by the house before, at all. before the crack era was it like was the south side like a safe community almost before the crack era, not really, because, mm. you know, crime was always around. And before the crack era kicked in real heavy, you know what I mean, niggas was criming. Like, That's a word that, like, I always identify when the OG, when I'm interviewing the OG and I'm talking to the OG, and they always say two words. They either say criming or cranking. Yeah, we, can, we can call it. break the, that down? We called it criming, you know what I'm saying? Because... It wasn't just all about cranking, you know what I'm saying? You might hit a car that have a bunch of money in that motherfucker, or, you know, mm-hmm. anything, you know, but cranking was the central part of the whole shit because there was money in certain cars, like Trans Ams, they came with the Ricaros and the Eagle Meats. Nigga gonna get those. The Dooleys had the tailgates and the big, 
wheels PMD and tires and on the PMDs. And yeah. So, you know, man, certain cars, I rock Zs and shit like that. Like you was, those cars was a, a hot item. And of course, the El Dorados and shit like that, that the Swingers came on. I, I talked to an OG, I can't remember who it was, but he was real, he was older, way older than me. I think he might have been like in his late 50s, but he said that the first time that he seen elbows was the white man. He was like, you know, the, seeing the white man riding the elbows back in the day, you know what I'm saying? Is that like a true statement to where like that was like really the first time you seen those wheels? Shit. And them the only people, I mean, when they when they came out on the Eldorados and shit, like, those were the only people who had the motherfuckers. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, of course, probably niggas at the beginning phase, that's probably the first people they saw on them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I try to do my history, like, every time I, like, interview a side of town or an OG or something, I can't never find in 1984 somebody actually riding a Cadillac Eldorado on those wheels. You couldn't really, you couldn't afford them. Yeah. 84 niggas wasn't rolling <laughs> Eldorado. Like it wasn't folks. nobody that had an 84 Eldorado and was like, I'm gonna go steal some wheels no. and put them on this car. Back, 84 niggas was still rollers and cutlasses and MCs and Grand Prix's, mm -hmm. short bodies. You know what I'm saying? That why, was the, that why, was. Why was those the cars that y'all gravitated to? The Cutlass and the Cutlass, the, the Regals, Regals, the and MCs. Because, I mean, you got different cities that they ride different things. Yeah. And during them times in the early 80s, it was like that was like the main thing that everybody rode. Well, you know, the, the motherfuckers had a, like an exquisite design to them. Like the Regal, mm -hmm. that's what that bitch looked like, Regal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, the design of it, it was like an S. Mm -hmm. and that motherfucker, you know what I'm saying? That Regal, the body on that hoe was just... You know, it was it was real sleek. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so the 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 Monte Carlos and shit like that, the design, the body styles on them was just so funky. I mean, still to this day, niggas ain't got over them because yeah. they that funky. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. Yeah. Okay, so I'm about to ask a question. This is just my uh my ignorance, you know, just being a little bit younger. Did some did some of those cars already come with Hollywood and T-Tops, or did was that something that y'all created? Some of them did. Like, some Cutlasses already came with Hollywoods, and I mean, with T-Tops, not mm -hmm. Hollywoods. You know, Hollywoods is something that mostly came in sports cars. You know what I'm saying? Like Trans Ams. Corvettes you know, like, and different shit like that. So what niggas did is took that and transferred it over to the uh mcs and shit like that and, mm -hmm. and put the hollywood with the with the uh the uh the luxury cars they kind of yeah. yeah, okay, kind of okay. short body luxury cars when was the first time that you got your first set of elbows and how did you get them i got my first set of elbows at 14 years old 14 years old can you just explain like how you got them? If you can. Uh, my cousin Lily, you know what I'm saying? My cousin Lily and uh, Chris and Big Main and, <laughs> you know, these niggas was professional crime. These niggas were professional crimers. Mm. So, shit, them niggas just end up having some and that nigga gave me them hoes for little or nothing. Like how much? Because I always hear the stories that I, like I say, I, like I keep saying through the interview, like I'm a little bit younger, so we only hear the stories that people older than us tell. So they'll tell us that, oh yeah, the wheels were ten thousand dollars. So people my age think that back in the day it was ten thousand dollars. Hell no, nah, that motherfucker was three hundred dollars. That's crazy. Three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. What spots during this time was y'all hitting? First off. When you put your first set together, 14 years old, like, how did that feel? Was it already a thing to where, like, because I know this is, like, in the 80s, so was it already a thing to where, like, everybody understood what these wheels was and the importance of these wheels? Because we always hear that, you know, those wheels was hard to find. Was it during that era or was it during the era when it was kind of like, See, it was the first, it was the beginning of it? Like, in the 80s, 
this was before jacking and all that shit. You know what I mean? Like in the '80s, criming was really fun. Mm. Like niggas was rolling, all niggas all rolling and criming and rolling the same rims basically, cause mm. you know it was just about if a nigga catch you slipping, mm. nigga gonna leave your shit on the belly, your rims gonna be gone, and a nigga gonna laugh it off, and nigga gonna get somebody for their rims. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But that's how it was. So it was a revolving door kind of like, so niggas was just. You know, niggas was catching niggas slipping. If you left your safe car off, nigga didn't see your safe car. Some niggas got so good at it, it didn't matter if you have a safe car alarm or not. Niggas still was gonna steal your shit. So yeah. it got that it got to that point. So now you just said something that was kinda different the way you said it. What's the difference between cranking and jacking? Cranking is like catching you slipping. Jacking is straight up taking your shit. Meaning, get out the car. Get out the car, rob you, put the pistol on you, take your car. You know, it wasn't going down like that yeah. in the 80s. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it didn't get, start going down like that till like late 80s, mm-hmm. going into the 90s. Is that because people started to understand those wheels? Understand, because you know, you had the first generation that came out and they was the first people to ride on those wheels. The next generation was like, oh, we want those wheels. Oh, we realizing that we can't find these wheels. We need to take them. I'm going to be honest with you. California gang influence influenced some of that. Break that down. Like, so in LA, in LA, niggas was already jacking. And when Ice Cube came out with America's Most Wanted, and he was talking about jack them niggas in them Nissan trucks, right in the drive-thru. Mm-hmm. Niggas, get the shit, get out the car, nigga, get out, you know. So that kind of influenced the jacking culture, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Because a lot of niggas already got some outlaw in them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you hear some shit <laughs> that appealed to that aspect of you mm. like nigga hell yeah fuck that shit nigga i'll take a nigga shit man i ain't gonna lie i got this good liquor in me you know what i'm saying <laughs> so i got a lot of questions we're only 10 minutes in i'm only three questions in but man why like how did uh like i guess cool, when you said about the ice cube situation how did y'all adapt to we gonna create this own thing because it's like a term nowadays where like a south side player you know what I'm saying? And right. it's a stigma to the South Side. Like, you know, being on the South Side, you play, you know what I'm saying? And it's always been like that since the 80s. Well, you know, the South Side, it's a code. You know what I mean? A nigga gonna keep him a little drip. You ain't gonna keep something, on, something nice on his old pinky, something on his, something on his arm, something on his chest. You know, nigga dress code gonna... You gonna be on point on your dress code. You ain't gonna be looking all crazy. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Keep your car uh, up to par. You know what I'm saying? Gonna keep that boy washed up, shined up, looking good. You probably gonna have you something nice to smoke on or something to drink. You know what I'm saying? So it's a code. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And and how you deal with women and different things like that. You know, ain't no kissing and telling. You know, you gonna. You and the broad, y'all gonna have a relationship, y'all gonna kick it, and you know, y'all gonna do y'all thing, she gonna go her way, she, you gonna go yours, and ain't no, you know, ain't gonna be a word said about it. Mm-hmm. You know, but it's just a it's just a code. Yeah. How you how you carry yourself, yeah. you know, and being player, it ain't just all about fucking a bunch of bitches, but it's how you conduct yourself. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? How you carry yourself. Okay, so when I do these interviews, in my head as y'all talking, I kind of always paint a picture in my head, and I feel like I'm almost in those years, those eras, you know what I'm saying? Can you kind of paint a picture for me, like, during this time, late 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, early 90s, what spots are y'all hitting? Late 80s, early 90s? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, man, like... Late 80s, early 90s, you had the Rhinestone Wrangler, you had the main event. You know, mid 80s, you had cartoons, you had the zoo, you had, you know, it's so many. 
uh, on the north side, you definitely, like I say, you had the Rhinestone Wrangler. That was jumping. Carrington's had Carrington's been jumping for a thousand years. Carrington been jumping since the eighties. So that was jumping before y'all. Carrington was basically jumping before us. I ain't gonna lie. Carrington's uh, been around forever. This slab OG TV, like I say, I'm younger. We messed up Carrington's. We messed it up. They don't allow, you know what I'm saying, everybody to swing through there. Because, you know, it's a lot of wrecks that happen, <coughs> shootings that didn't happen, you know what I'm used to be beautiful on the inside. Paint a picture for me, like, pull it into the parking lot. Are those zebras? Yeah, these, these, uh, volas, these custom made from Italy, uh, this leather, this zebra suede, uh, all the vola shoes are custom made from Italy and shipped from Italy. Do volas have anything for women? Yeah, Volas have stuff for women and kids. Uh, Volas have wedges, heels, matching purses, uh, belts, shirts. It's the new fashion brand. Yeah, there's uh, people in the entertainment industry, uh, rappers, producers, all different type of artists. Uh, there's athletes, uh, everyday uh, people that love fashion, you know, uh, professional business people, and just people that love fashion all over the world that's embracing the Volaz fashion. And where can I get mine? Volaz.biz. You got to get it from Volaz.biz because they special ordered, special made in Italy, shipped from Italy straight to your doorstep. Volaz.biz. used to have cherry wood walls with cherry wood and green pool tables. I'm talking about everything was wood and it was, it was just beautiful on mm -hmm. the inside. Paint a picture for me, cause like, like I always talk to my pops, and he always kind of say back in them times, if you had a car, you damn near wasn't even going into the club. You was really parking lot pimping. Well, yeah, yeah, but we used to go into the club sometimes, but most times, like you say, parking lot pimping. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Cornbreads after carrying to cornbread got real big in the '90s. Cornbread was crazy. You know what I'm saying? Anything. They say that you had to be, like, it, it used to be people that used to get in the trunk of the car because at a point in time, they used to have to pay to get into the parking lot. Is oh, yeah, true? yeah, yeah. It was crazy like that. Yeah. They were just making people pay to come in the parking lot. And so you had 90, uh, what is it, Club 9.9. .9. Mm -hmm. Jamaica, Jamaica lasted That's from the hours, 80s yeah. Yeah. through the, you know, so you got some clubs that just, Never, you just never say die, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. But all the way up through the 80s and the 90s, Carrington and Jamaica, Jamaica was the two uh, foundational clubs that just weathered the storm. Yeah, okay, you know okay. What I'm saying? You had Palladium on the north side in the, in the, uh, like the late 80s, early 90s. It was a lot of them, it was a lot yeah. of them, you know? Now, I'm going to fast forward a little bit, because like I said, we 15 minutes in and now they got to the first three questions. Right on. Man, uh, what is the SA Fools? The SA Fools is a neighborhood clique. You know what I'm saying? The white folks are probably, you know, anything where it's three or more people, they call that a gang. But SA Fools was a clique of niggas getting money. And so one day, my partner Willie D was like, you know, man, I wish a nigga would, you know, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, a nigga go through there and act a goddamn fool. And my homeboy Kevin Green said, nigga gonna go through that bitch and act a essay fool. And the name stuck. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And the name stuck from there. And so that's how the name Essay Fools came about. What year, I ain't gonna say that the Essay Fool was the Essay Fools, but like, that you would really know these SA fools. What what year was that? Mm. Cause a lot of people that, that watch this channel, if they follow about the magazine, you know what I'm saying? If they follow the history of the timeline, they always hear about the SA fools. Right. So right now the the SA fools is like stuff a legend, you know, when you start talking about Toast and and my brother Dylan and mm -hmm. DA and so when the dope game kinda when it went full blast, you know, it, uh, shit, every nigga in my, in my neighborhood was having money 
And so we was like BMF before BMF mm. on some real shit. That, that's a good. That's a good uh, description again. You, you know yeah. what I mean? So, like, so most motherfuckers in the city they were coming fucking with us on on the uh, business tip. Mm. So I would say probably about 87, 88, that's when the SA Fools got really, really established. Mm. But by the time the 90s hit, we was like at the top of the game. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because Face, you know, Face was doing his thing. Mm. Scarface. Yeah, Face was doing his thing and on, he used on to, the music like the tip. early, uh, I think, his first... His first album, uh, Scarfaces, back and then uh, the world is yours. He was for sure repping SA Fools on exactly. That. So, so face he got a chance to see the game before any other musicians in the city saw the game because we saw the game before a lot of you know a lot of people. Mm. You know what I mean? So we was making money in the game before a lot of like. When we was making money in the game, Harm Clark was still a nice neighborhood, pretty much. Like my niggas in Harm Clark, though, you know they were they was more on the robbery tip. Mm. Most city was still nice, you know what I mean? They it wasn't it wasn't out there. It was just really like in Sunnyside, some parts of South Park, Fifth Ward, Third Ward. That's where the game was. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. Okay, okay. Yeah. So we was we caught the early stages of the game and so a lot of stuff that was exposed to face, it wasn't exposed to a lot of rappers. You just mentioned a neighborhood. I just did an interview with Stefan and uh Melvin Terry and I asked this question in this interview. I done did a probably about like three, four interviews with people from Harm Clark. Did the slab start in Harm Clark? No, slab didn't. I don't think the slab started in Harm Clark. Because, I mean, they always talk about Smitty, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's a couple other people from Smitty Harm Clark. Smitty not from Harm Clark. Smitty from Sunnyside. See, I just did the interview with Melvin Terry and Stefan, and I didn't know that. They, they yeah, said Smitty, it in the interview. Smitty from Sunnyside. Smitty grew up in uh, jailhouse apartments. Mm -hmm. Him and Little Larry and Kenna Bell. All them niggas went to elementary school together. So when Smitty family moved to Harm Clark, you know, Smitty didn't want to be in Harm Clark, so he run away from home and he go stay with little Larry. So why do people why do why do a lot of people from Harm Clark and a couple other people say that? That it started in Harm Clark? Because they probably didn't know the whole details of the whole ins and outs and the, the whole details of the story, but mm -hmm. but yeah, you know, Smitty is from a uh, jailhouse apartment, Sunnyside. Yeah. Okay, okay. And man, it's uh two names that like in the Scarface songs and just me knowing and doing my research on the SA Foods that I always hear about Toast and your brother Dylan. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to the viewers, you know what I'm saying? Because this is going to be a first time where I really interview somebody that was in depth, you know what I'm saying? Know these people, family with these people. Who who were they? Toast and the dollar. Toast was like, I'm gonna tell you something. If Toast was in Hollywood, he'll probably be like a Hollywood playboy. He was helping us some type of shit. You know what I mean? Cause Toast gonna bag some hoes, man. You know he gonna he gonna bag some hoes, and that's all he wanna do. He was upset. he was younger than all of y'all, right? Yeah, basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so. So Toad was fascinated with the slab, you know what I mean? He was fascinated with that shit, you know what I mean? And so, so the thing was, is Toad was kind of open. He was a little more open than we was, but so Toad was more made for the, 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 the glitz and the glamour. If he'd have been in Hollywood somewhere, he probably would have climbed the ranks of doing some music producing or, or doing some kind of television shit because mm -hmm. that's the type of person he was you know yeah. he like playboy philanthropist mm -hmm. you know what i mean smart intelligent yeah and a cool motherfucker so toast was like that now tell me this i didn't did my research 
and like I be digging into it, and I didn't found to where like I asked the question, and I like to ask the question that was around him and around that side of town during that time. Was toast the comp- the first complete slab? When I mean complete, I mean paint, insides, belt, buckles, grill. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> Roof. Like, was he the first complete slab? Fifth, everything. You know what? Now that you say that, I think Toast Car was the first complete slab. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was because he had the he had the uh, he had the spare on the trunk, mm-hmm. and he had the uh, he had the vinyl, mm-hmm. candy, television. Yeah, Toast was the first complete slab. Mm-hmm. Slam back severe. Yeah, Toast was the first complete slab. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Lil Bubba came out with the hard top candy with the uh, with with the bumper. He was the first one on the bumper. My drop was the first one I put the wood grain in. Uh, okay, Quincy. so this is a question I be trying to figure out too. I thought Toast sold his car to Bubba, Lil Bubba, or or Corey Blunt. No, no. all three of them was <clears throat> different cars. Mm-mm. What a lot of people don't know is Corey. Corey used to like yellow mm-hmm. when we first when niggas was first fucking with Corey. So Corey cars was yellow. Mm-hmm. And so when we started fucking with Corey, he kind of came on the burgundy side and the candy side and you know toned it down on the mm-hmm. the uh the yellow side. But yeah, but so Corey when when Corey and Toast started kicking it, we all started kicking it. So we all started coming different codes of can- candy. Like my car was brandy wine. Toast car was Brickyard Red. Trevin car was like, uh, I forgot, it was like a cherry wine. Uh, Little Bubble car was like Sunset Red. It was, it was a bunch of different candies, you know what I'm saying? Different colors of candy. Mm-hmm. Nobody car really looked alike, you know what I'm saying? But it was different color codes of candy. Because mm-hmm. candy is the highest color code you can get on a car, so. Mm-hmm. That's what, it, you know, it influenced our decision to, to go, come with the candy, those mm-hmm. different color candy codes, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And so we kind of personified it, magnified it to the point to where it stuck. Mm-hmm. And when it stuck, it became the culture. Yeah. Like you had to have candy, you had to have foes, you had to be on the inside, you had to be trunk. You know what I'm saying? You had to be surrounded by sound. Like you, in order to be complete, that's what you had to have. Yeah. You did, the, did the death of Toast affect the South Side? Like, how did it affect the South Side? I think the death of Toast and Dylan affected the South Side. The Toast, of, the, the death of Toast and Dylan, like Dylan death is, was crazy, but. The death of Toast and Dylan. The death of Toast was like, it was so horrific because it was a multiple homicide. You yeah, know, four my, people my, died at my once. My mom, she from, uh, she from Mo City, you know what I'm saying? My dad from Homestead, my mom from Mo City. And she knew, I, I can't remember her name, but whoever was Toast was dating during that time, and that was her friend, and she always say that during that time when Toast passed away, like, that really affected the South Side, like, for real, for real. Right. Like, that was like a big thing but that it, had it was, happened. It was, it was a fucked up thing because at that time, like, when that happened, it was like a rash of, you know, kick doors and uh, homicides was happening. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, niggas was running in niggas shit and killing niggas for money. Like, mm-hmm. that shit was lame, but, you know, that's what was going on. You know, niggas thought that was some cool shit, but that was some lame shit. Mm-hmm. So, it's, it just turned into uh, just like a rash of that shit just broke out. Like, motherfuckers yeah. started, you know, think that was the thing to do. Run in and rob a nigga, kill a nigga, you know, shit yeah. like that. 